Nearly 100 years after the Emancipation Proclamation, African Americans in southern states still inhabited a starkly unequal world of disenfranchisement, segregation, and various forms of oppression, including race-inspired violence, such as being removed from the whites-only restaurants, being pummeled with water from high-pressure fire hoses, and attacked viciously by police dogs. Jim Crow laws at the local and state level required black and whites to have separate drinking fountains, restrooms, classrooms, and bathrooms, and barred them from certain theaters, train cars, juries, and legislatures. If there is something that you want to do and in your heart, you know that it needs to be changed, modified, or turned upside down, go ahead and do it. Many leaders from within the African American community and beyond rose to prominence during the Civil Rights era, including Martin Luther King, Mahatma Gandhi, Rosa Parks, Malcolm X, Nina Simone, and others. A major factor of the protest was the strategy of protesting for equal rights without using violence. Millions of blacks and whites took to the streets for peaceful protests, as well as acts of civil disobedience and economic boycotts in what some leaders described as America's second civil war. Despite advances in the fight for racial equality, including the landmark 1954 Supreme Court verdict in Brown v. Board of Education that ended segregation in schools and the Montgomery bus boycott, segregation was still the norm across the southern United States in 1960. On February 1, 1960, four black freshmen at the North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University, Franklin McCain, Joseph McNeil, Ezel Blair Jr., and David Richmond, took seats at the segregated lunch counter of F.W. Woolworths in Greensboro of North Carolina. They were refused service because of the color of their skin and sat peacefully until the store closed. Accepting and taking to the limit Martin Luther King Jr.'s ideas of nonviolence and peaceful protest, the sit-ins provoked the type of reaction the civil rights movement wanted, public condemnation of the treatment of those involved, but also continuing to highlight the issue of desegregation in the South. Organized primarily by the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, the sit-ins symbolized a change in the mood of African American people. I was really very, very angry uh, that someone had denied my existence as if I had changed suddenly. Uh, I'm no longer this kid in New York that everybody enjoys seeing. But somebody, somehow somebody has put a mask over me, and, and now I have to be somebody very different than who I was. Uh, the same thoughtful person. I was the same. I didn't change, but people's opinion of me changed. Uh, and that was one of the dehumanizing aspects of racial segregation. Uh, the result of uh, that dehumanization on this occasion it provoked me to, to want to do something. I'm tired of talking about this stuff. Uh, we could talk forever uh, about how angry it makes us to have to live this way, uh, how angry it makes us to see our parents have to live this way, uh, how angry the likelihood of our offspring would be brought up under this system of dehumanization. So, that anger culminated and, and a resolve that, all right, we're going to do something and we're going to do it quickly. By design that we came to this place, we wanted a place where there was really a dichotomy of offering and treatment and respect to people simply based on their color. The movement sparked throughout the South, motivating many other black students and colleges to go out and do the same. They all were fighting for racial equality, and with their very bodies, they obstructed the wheels of injustice. Inspired by the Greensboro Four's nonviolent protests, in July of 1963, St. Augustine, Florida teenagers Joanne Ulmer, Audrey Nell Edwards, Samuel White, and Willie Singleton, known as the St. Augustine Four, emerged as celebrated figures of the Civil Rights Movement. 
they, along with other black activists, met at St. Paul's AME Church in Lincolnville and walked downtown with their placards on Washington Street to the Woolworths drugstore. Omer, Edwards, White, and Singleton were refused service and jailed with other protesters for asking for a Coke and a hamburger at a whites-only Woolworths lunch counter. The four were sent to juvenile detention for six months for their crimes and ordered released on January 14, 1964 by the governor and Florida cabinet. I am shown here with an original section of the St. Augustine Woolworths lunch counter, which is now located in the Wells Fargo Bank building on King Street in St. Augustine. It is the only surviving section of the restaurant, which was gutted from the Woolworths building at 31 King Street almost a decade ago. It features the counter, footrest, and original stools. Though many of the protesters were arrested for trespassing, disorderly conduct, or disturbing the peace, their actions made an immediate and lasting impact, forcing Woolworths and other establishments to change their segregationist policies. The Civil Rights Act of 1964, which ended segregation in public places and banned employment discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, or national origin, is considered one of the crowning legislative achievements of the Civil Rights Movement. First proposed by President John F. Kennedy, it survived strong opposition from Southern members of Congress and was then signed into law by Kennedy's successor, Lyndon B. Johnson. Like the Greensboro sit-ins, nonviolent methods of protesting are still being used by people in America and around the world. Nonviolent protests by professional and college players, modern-day human rights activists, and everyday people who hope to change laws, rules, or policies that are unfair or biased. By initiating the Greensboro sit-ins, the Greensboro Four were able to nonviolently take a stand, or in this case a seat, for what they believed in, in order to change the course of history and end segregation. Thank you.